from Galilee to Galilee. Hey everybody, this is Grant with your Wednesday night devotional. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope that as you listen to these different devotionals through the week, that it's helping you as, as during this time as we are apart from each other. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that, especially on Sunday mornings, I've been teaching about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, all the way back to the triumphal entry when Jesus comes into Jerusalem with this crowd of people celebrating through the death of Jesus, the resurrection, and last week we were talking about Jesus' appearances to his disciples. In all of this, this, this material, as we go through it, there is a lot that is left unsaid. So many little sermons that don't get to be preached. One is about this journey of Jesus and the disciples from Galilee to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem back to Galilee. It starts in Matthew chapter 17 as they leave Galilee toward Capernaum and then they travel through Pergia, uh, through Jericho on their way to, to Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 21, the crowds answered as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. See, they knew where Jesus was coming from. They knew about this crowd because the Galileans were different than the people that lived in Jerusalem, almost like another tribe, kind of like the country bumpkins of Israel. And then after the, the trial and death and resurrection of Jesus, they are told to go back to Galilee. The disciples are told to go back to Galilee. Matthew 28, verse 10, Jesus told them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and they will see me. And we know that they listened to Jesus, that they obeyed Jesus because Matthew tells us that they did. Matthew 28, verse 16 says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Can you imagine how different they were? after being with Jesus in Jerusalem, after being part of his death, burial, and resurrection, and even having seen the risen body of Jesus, how different they were when they got back to their hometown. They would be almost completely different people. There would be no way for them to explain what had happened to them. Could you imagine what it would be like to be one of the disciples that had been with Jesus? Imagine if you had bore witness to the celebration of his entrance, been with him as he cleared the temple, sat at the table with him during the Last Supper, had Jesus wash your feet, had been around when he was tempted and betrayed, put on trial and crucified, and then also been around for the ripping of the temple curtain, the earthquakes, the dead walking in the empty tomb. Imagine for a second if you met Jesus in a little Tate County. And you followed him, you got to know him, you were impressed by his teaching, and you become one of his early disciples, and you follow him to Memphis. And all the things that happened to him in Jerusalem actually happened in Memphis. And there was no way, there was no way, no one back at home even knew what was going on, right? There was a blackout, there was no news cycle, no one was talking about what was going on in Memphis. And you got back home, and no one had experienced what you had experienced. How could you explain what had happened? How could you explain the empty tomb, the resurrected Jesus when you got back home? What I want to suggest is that many of us have already had a Jerusalem experience. We've had something so significant happen to us that it changed the world around us. The Jerusalem event was both terrible and beautiful. It was terrible because Jesus went through this shame and, and these trials and temptation and this horrible death. But it was also beautiful because it showed God's love for his people. It showed God's power of life over death. It showed God's investment in us in his willingness to make Jesus the very vessel of our own salvation. It also showed the disciples a lot about who they were. Remember all the bravado that they had had? Remember how they would never leave or forsake Jesus, that they would be with Jesus to the death. They would never doubt Jesus, yet all of them doubted. We want to put that on Thomas sometimes, and we have even gone so far as to give Thomas the nickname Doubting Thomas, but we know 
from what we studied about in John chapter 20, that all the disciples doubted, that Mary doubted, that everybody thought that Jesus had actually died, and they were wondering where his body was. That Jesus showed up, he had to show them his scars, he had to show them his signs so that they could know it was really him. Does this sound familiar? Have you ever faced something really difficult? Difficulty teaches us a lot about ourself. The flip side is on the other side of difficulty. We learn a lot about what we're made of. We enter into a time that's incredibly difficult, so difficult that we question our own reality. Nothing seems to work the way that it did before. The world is just different. We don't know how we'll make it through. We may metaphorically just throw up our hands and give up. Yet if we can get through it, if we can come out the other side, sometimes the very world that we live in is transformed for the better. We can appreciate the little things of life. Our relationships are stronger. Our faith is deeper. We can find life after death. But we, like the disciples, have to go back to Galilee. How do we describe our own transformation something that is indescribable. Have you ever made changes that your family and friends didn't understand? This is normal for people that really get serious about following Jesus. Sometimes the very people that brought them to church don't understand the changes that have come over them, don't understand the changes that they've made. People don't always understand growth. And to be honest, sometimes they don't like it, particularly if it makes them feel guilty because it points at things that they need to change themselves. Now, there are two ways to grow that I want to mention briefly. One is we make little changes and we create some better habits and we begin to see some transformation in our life. Another is an encounter with God. Through this encounter, we are transformed. And a lot of times, encounters with God come at difficult times in our life, times when we're just ready to throw up our hands and give up. Very often, that act of giving up, that act of surrender, is what leaves space for God to transform us into who he wants us to become. Now, here's the thing. People don't always understand that transformation. If you've ever had something like that happen to you, where maybe you were facing something really difficult, and all you could do is pray, and you know that at the end of that, something happened, and you came out a different person than you were before. Maybe it was in a time of prayer. Maybe it was in a time of worship. Maybe you heard a sermon that you responded to, and something within you clicked, and it changed. And when it changed, it changed for real. When we've had encounters with God of that nature, people don't always understand them. But here's the other thing. Sometimes the little changes that we make and the changes that only God can make, the encounters that we have with God work together. How does this work? You may be asking yourself, how does this work, Grant? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, sometimes we make little changes that put us on a collision course for an encounter with God. And we do this by doing all the little things that a lot of us have grown up being trained to do. We can do it by spending time in God's Word, by reading our Bibles. We can do it through prayer. We can do it through experiences of worship. And sometimes that lines us up with an encounter with God. Sometimes those encounters simply come through the difficulty that happens with life. And we know if we've lived long enough, there's always difficulty. So our job when we hit that difficulty is not to wonder where God is. It is to find God in that difficulty, that suffering. As Jesus came down to earth, was willing to suffer with humanity. What we can recognize that is that in our suffering, sometimes that's exactly where we find Jesus. And that encounter, when we encounter God in that difficulty, is something that can change us in a way that maybe no one else understands, but we know is true within ourselves. Our job, after we've had this encounter, after we've been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, is to come back to Galilee, not to neglect our people, but to come back unashamed of what God has done in us, as weird as it may seem to them. And allow people to see the Spirit of God, the living Jesus in us as we are transformed into His image and likeness.
A Jerusalem event can be difficult, but when we face Jerusalem with courage, with the peace of Jesus, the resurrection event can breathe life back into us. The resurrection rose Jesus from the dead, but the resurrection also promises us life. The resurrection of Jesus is for the whole world, but it's also for us. And it lets us know that where we've experienced death, where we've messed up, where we feel like things are out of order, then, then God, through the power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, can bring life back into the places where death once reigned. And when we are changed, we have to bring that change back to the house back to work, back to our friends and family, back to our own Galilee. Have a great week. God bless.